So today let's explore this 40 watt USB charger. It has two USB-C ports, an indication LED probably, and this marking here. The input is a universal mains and the output 3 amps for 5, 9 and 12 volts. 2.66 amps for 15 volts and 2 amps for 20 volts. 40 watt speed. My friend bought it from AliExpress and donated it to me. So big thanks for the donation. It was about 15 dollars. So there is a chance it could be better than this one from the previous video. But of course we have to explore it closer. It has a European plug. So let's try to plug it in. No explosion. Is the LED lighting up? It's not. Let's connect the tester to it. 5 volts. It has detected some charging protocols. And the same thing on the other part. You can switch the voltages here. It works up to 20 volts. Nice. But of course now my test load and let's try to load it. 5 volts. Works up to about 3.3 amps. Nine volts about the same. Twelve volts. Again, fifteen volts. Up to three amps and twenty volts. Up to 2.1 amps, 2.2. It does actually supply the current, it claims, at least in a short run. Now let's try to run it a bit longer. Let's try to test it at 15 volts, 2.66 amps, about 40 watts. And there is actually an indicator light, but super dim, only visible in dark. After two hours, still no failure, but it's bloody hot. The temperature's not so bad on this side. But on the other side, it's worse. Yes, it's 98 degrees Celsius and in the USB port 101 degrees Celsius. I guess I should run it horizontal, not vertical, because this is a more realistic operating position. Wall sockets are not facing up. This actually makes it even worse. 111 degrees Celsius. You could cook on it. But now, of course, the internals. Can I open it? That's it. it. Comes out, and it's on two boards. It looks quite convoluted inside of it. But before further opening it, I should do a thermal imaging of it. If the cover is 111 degrees, what are the components? Putting it back together, let's run it for a couple hours and then let's quickly open it and see the temperature of the internals. It has been running for two hours, loaded at 40 watts. I will open it and quickly look at it with a thermal camera. Of course, don't try this at home, let's quickly unplug it, pull it out, plug it back in, remove this and look at it using the thermal camera. The primary switching chip is 158 degrees Celsius, and that's the surface. The actual silicon has to be even hotter than this. There's another chip, 136 degrees Celsius. The transformer is 128 degrees Celsius. And of course, after I took it from the box, it's already cooling down, so I guess it was several degrees hotter when it was actually in the box. The primary switching chip is also now several degrees cooler than it was. On the other side of it, some secondary chips, 123 degrees Celsius. This one is for the part I'm loading. The other one is less hot. And the primary electrolytic capacitor is 116 degrees Celsius. Nice. This polymer capacitor, 111. This, about 100. Of course, let's also weigh it before losing all the internals. It's almost 70 grams. This one was 53 and about 40 without the weights. But now let's explore this one further. The mains comes in here into this board. 
which seems to then continue into this one. There seems to be some interference suppression of fuse in Russia limitation on this board. I have to disassemble it to see what's on the boards. From this board it continues here. There seems to be some interference suppression inductor here. Then it goes into the smoothing capacitor on the primary side. And there is some small chip, not sure what it is. And here seems to be the isolation line, an optocoupler, probably a Y1 capacitor, and a slot here for isolation. So this thing is actually on the secondary side already. It could be the synchronous rectifier. Here's the primary switching chip, I guess, with some resistors, snubber network. Most of it is in the chip. Here is probably the primary and auxiliary of the transformer. Where is the secondary of it? It probably has to go somewhere into this if it's a synchronous rectifier. And these two chips are basically communicating with the loads and probably also enabling the voltage to the ports. Unlike USB-A ports, USB-C ports always require some active circuitry, some chip communicating and enabling the voltage. The voltage doesn't go directly to the output. It's switched by the chip. And a lot of capacitors here. Not much else on this board. Here are probably the smoothing capacitors on the secondary side. The port is here. Some inductors here under these covers. It seems some interconnection between the boards. And some more chips here. Maybe these chips are for the communication. And these are just some transistors switching the voltage. And the secondary of the transformer seems to go here, which makes sense if this is the synchronous rectifier chip. And the primary smoothing capacitor is rated for 105 degrees Celsius. Well, loaded at full 40 watts, it was actually hotter than this, by at least 11 degrees, but after taken from the box it was already ventilated and cooling down, so I guess it was even hotter. Let's take a closer look at this. It appears to be a Y1 capacitor in an SMD version, so it seems to be safe. 152, 1.5 nano. And the insulation distance is quite large here. Here is this insulation layer, which I can probably pull from it. It's also covering the transformer here. Seems nicely designed. It can actually supply a different voltage on each part. This one is now 12 volts, and this one can be switched independently. Now 15, 12, 9, 5. This is really not bad. It's just better not to load it at full 40 watts, so it doesn't get super hot. Given it can supply two different voltages, these chips are probably some buck regulators, maybe synchronous, using these inductors. Could be boost regulators, but buck regulators are probably more efficient. This also explains the high number of secondary capacitors in it. I guess the secondary of the transformer goes through this synchronous rectifier chip into these two capacitors. And then it goes through the synchronous buck regulators into this capacitor for this port and this capacitor for this port. Let's do a dodgy measurement, of course, while it's running. One port supplies 20 volts now. And this is its capacitor. One is 12 volts. I guess this is the capacitor for it. Yes, it is. And the other two capacitors. The one is 22 volts. This is on the same rail, 22. Now I switch the both outputs to just 5 volts. And these capacitors after the synchronous rectifier still have the same voltage, 22 volts. So the switching power supply supplies a constant voltage, independent of the output voltage, and it's then converted using the buck regulators for the outputs. I was going to probe an oscilloscope into the secondary terminals of the transformer, and I noticed that this solder joint is actually quite crappy. Not much solder actually bridging the wire to the board. Here is the secondary starting at maximum load and reducing the load. It seems to be constant on time. It reduces the frequency with less load. And only at a very light load it actually reduces the on time. And the frequency at full load seems to be 180 kHz. And with no load about 26 or 30 kHz. And actually in a burst mode. A series of pulses and then a gub here. This is one of the buck regulator inductors at 5 volts. 9. 12, 15, and 20. Increasing the duty cycle based on the demanded output voltage and the switching frequency is about 150 kilohertz. But now of course it should go completely to bits. Let's desolder this. And this. And it comes apart. There was even a cover 
for this capacitor I guess. So the primary side capacitor doesn't short to the secondary side. You can see the secondary side board with the capacitors parallel to the outputs. These back regulator inductors and the boards for the ports with the chips on them. And here is the primary side with these smoothing capacitors, the transformer, the secondary wires, these capacitors after the synchronous rectifier and some interference separation filter here and NTC thermistor in rush current limitation, the fuse. Let's actually try to desolder this board as well. There is some resin here that's going to smoke horribly. This is now separated, not much under it. This interference separation inductor here now visible. And on this board, the bridge rectifier, interference separation inductor, some NTC thermistor, the fuse, and that's it. This is the marking of the polymer capacitors, the marking of the primary switching chip, the synchronous rectifier chip, and the mysterious chip on the primary side, the 6-pin one, and close to the optocoupler there is a 3-pin package. This is the voltage reference, the chips on the USB board, this is probably a MOSFET switching the voltage, this is the communication chip, and one of the back regulator chips here. And here's a cyan LED, but virtually no light from it good here, especially because of this cover and the bad position of the LED. The NTC thermistor marking. I wonder what was the temperature of the other primary capacitor, which is even more enclosed in it in the Midland, with this on top. It was completely surrounded by other components in it. Desoldering the transformer. Now the transformer is desoldered. Let's remove all the tape from it. Here is its marking and even more tape. We kept on tape here. And this copper shield on it. This is a very nice transformer actually. And this tape around it. Another copper shield. Some interference gets capacitively coupled into the core and this stops it from radiating. And this is a short turn for the leaking magnetic field. So the magnetic flux has to stay inside of the core instead of completing the circles outside of it. Of course it has to be a short turn going outside, not inside like the windings. The windings go through here. This is really seriously designed. The secondary terminals seem to have these sleeves, which also continue inside of the transformer here. And there is, based on the color, probably a very thick safety triple insulated secondary wire. This one wasn't as easy to open as the crappy ones. The freight core has an air gap in the middle because it was a flyback switching power supply. And here are the windings. Let's remove this tape. Even more tape. And the first winding. One, two, three, sixteen. 17 turns, and this connection between the halves of the primary, I guess. Then an insulation tape with no gaps. One layer, two layers. There's some, let's say, shield. A winding with one end loose. It's made of two thin wires in a parallel, and it reduces the interference. It's a return path for the high frequency current capacitively coupled from the primary back to the primary side. And then another layer of insulation. Again, no gaps here to be seen. One layer, two layers, and here the secondary. One turn, two, three, four, five. Then another layer of insulation with no gaps, one layer, two layers, almost three layers, and another shield maybe, or more likely the auxiliary, one, two, three, 
29 30 turns another indulation this is not critical because it's going to be between the auxiliary and the primary both on the primary side two layers almost three and the primary the second half of it it continues from this interconnection point which does not go to the board one two seventeen eighteen turns now let's examine the secondary a bit closer it might not be triple indulated, but it has a thick indulation on it and under it a lot of strands with a lacquer on them. And here not bare copper. This is of course to reduce the skin effect at high frequencies. It's running at quite a high frequency, 180 kHz, so it has to use quite a lot of thin strands. I counted about 43 strands, measured the diameter of the wires and here's the reverse engineered transformer. Well, let's think about it. I guess 30 turns is way too many for an auxiliary. I guess I confused the auxiliary and the 6 turn shield winding. When dissolving the transformer some of the pins came out of the bobbin instead of out of the board. And when you break the ends of the wire you really can't tell which winding had a loose end. It's more realistic it was this way and the shield was a continuation of the primary like this. This end is loose, this pin is the positive of the rectified main, as just the DC, and this pin has a high frequency voltage on it. And the high frequency voltage on this end is the opposite polarity of this one, so it's basically a counterbalance for the high frequency current capacitively coupled into the secondary, so these two ends cancel out and it doesn't introduce as much interference to the output. When you're impatient desoldering it, it makes the reverse engineering trickier. The secondary was insulated from the other windings using two layers of the sticky tape at least, with no gaps, plus this thick insulation, probably teflon, plus the lacquer on the strands, and the ends of the winding were covered using these sleeves, further insulating them from the other windings, where they could come into contact. And this looks like a reasonably safe transformer. Also the isolation distance on the board is nice, the Y1 capacitor between the primary and secondary side is nice, there is an insulation between the boards, it has a fuse in it, an MTC in rush limiting thermistor, some interference filtration, it can supply the power it claims and it can change the voltage independently on each port, but the LED is placed really poorly, there was the unfortunate bad solder joy in it, and the operating temperature at full load was just way too high. But the resistive losses in the windings and the on-state resistances of the MOSFETs go up with the square of the current. So let's say at a 30 watt load the temperature rise would be just half. I guess it would be completely usable at 30 watts. So the conclusion is... Slightly dodgy. So that's it and if you like my videos please consider subscribing, supporting the channel on Patreon or using the thanks button according to the value you receive from my videos. And big thanks to all of you who already support me because this channel couldn't exist without you.